speaker. There is no stranger to Rhodes, having visited and spoken on our campus just a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Omid Safi is professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Duke University, and he's the director of Duke's Islamic Studies <coughs> Center, a scholar of Islamic mysticism, contemporary Islamic thought, and medieval Islamic history. Dr. Safi is the author of many articles and numerous books, including Memories of Muhammad, what the, Why the Prophet Matters, and Radical Love, Teachings from the Islamic Mystical Tradition, which came out last year. Professor Safi's perspectives and opinions are often sought out in popular media, including the New York Times, Newsweek, Washington Post, PBS, NPR, NBC, CNN, and international media outlets. Uh, his work also appears frequently on the On Being Project blog. This evening's lecture is titled Rumi's Path to Divine Love in Islam. Dr. Safi's most recent book can be purchased after his talk. It's available right now uh, just outside this room. And we thank the Rhodes Bookstore for making copies of it available. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Omid Safi back to Rhodes College. Rahim. All right. So um, thank you all very, very much for joining us for this evening. Uh, before we get a chance to uh, launch into these delicious topics, uh, I have to tell you that long before I was invited, now for the second time, to talk at Rhodes, I had a previous experience at Rhodes College. Uh, back when I was a young man and driving cross country, um, uh, and I decided to take a commitment that one of the great medieval Muslim travelers, Ibn Battuta, had taken, which was to go around the world, never taking the same road more than once. And uh, so I figured out I was starting out from Florida, going to California, and coming back to North Carolina, and I wanted to come and go in different ways. And going out, I took I-40 and drove through uh, Memphis. And I was driving my uh, beat up old crappy Buick at that time. Um, and something happened about 50 miles outside of Memphis, which is that the cooling blade for my car, the, the, the thing that whirls and cools down the engine, it stopped working. Well, it wasn't really much of a problem because I was driving 70, 75, 80, <laughs> maybe a little higher. Um, and so the, the sheer wind that was passing through the car kept my engine nicely cooled down until I got to Memphis and it was around 5 o'clock and lo and behold there was a little bit of traffic. And so I'm watching the car engine temperature thing rise and rise and rise, and I'm panicking because this was a long time ago. This was, I was skinny, I had hair, um, and I had no cell phone. Um, and so I'm driving through a city where I don't know anyone, and I don't know where I am, uh, and my car is about to boil. Um, and so, it's a little bit like that movie Speed, if you ever any of you saw that with Keanu Reeves, where like you have to keep the bus going over. So at five o'clock traffic, I pulled off the highway and I'm driving like a maniac uh, through the streets of Memphis at 70 miles an hour to keep my car cooled down. And I finally get to these gated school, which looked like a really safe place to be. So I pulled in and my heart is like beating 100, you know, beats a second, and uh, I just decided to stay until the traffic had passed. And after about two, two and a half hours, I got back in my car and started driving 70, 75, 80. I never thought anything of it. I never thought I would go back to that place until a couple of years ago when I was invited to give a talk here. And we walked through the campus. I'm like, I recognize this place. This is that place that I stopped my car at uh, 25 years ago as a, 
as a young man. And so it's nice to be on your campus when I'm not driving like a maniac and trying to keep my car from blowing up. Um, so let me um, share with you the, uh, the topic of what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, I don't think I need to belabor uh, with you and for you all the kind of usual associations that people have when the discussion is about Islam and Muslims. Um, and tonight is a little bit of a departure from that. My hope is that we have a chance to spend about an hour talking about an aspect, a facet, a dimension of Islam that we very rarely encounter in our public conversation. And it is a rich, powerful, poetic dimension of Islam, sometimes called Sufism, um, which centers around the experience of love. Of love. Um, and this dimension, far from being something marginal, something out in the corners, something hushed and forbidden, was actually historically a dominant way that we as Muslims expressed our highest yearnings and aspirations. There um, is a very dear friend of mine, I still speak of him in the present tense, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, named Shahab Ahmed. Um, we came up through that cruel institution known as the Academy uh, together. Um, and part of Shahab's scholarship was to travel to manuscript libraries around the world and to count what types of manuscripts did people copy by hand. So nowadays you can go online and order your books from Amazon or from your local bookstore or the folks sitting outside. Um, if you're more like my students, you go on illegal Russian websites and you download illegal PDFs. I don't know. Before I had a PDF of my book, the Russian websites had a PDF of my book. I don't know who they know that I don't know, but apparently they know some pretty well-connected people. Um, and um, in the medieval times, every book that you read had to be copied by hand. And it takes time to copy a whole book by hand. The paper is expensive, the ink is expensive, and the amount of money you got to pay somebody, <coughs> bless you, to hand copy a book is expensive. So Shahab had this simple idea that if you go to a manuscript collection and you've got 5,000 copies of one book from different centuries and you've got one copy of another book, we can make some educated guesses about which book has been more influential, which book was more in demand. And what he found was something that, for those of us who study this tradition, is not so astonishing. But for many folks out there, um, if our impressions about Islam and Muslims have been shaped, let's say, in the last 20 years or so, uh, this is almost some bizarro planet that we wouldn't recognize. He found that uh, in the parts of the world that we're going to be talking about today, next to the Quran, and only the Quran, no other bodies of books had been historically copied more frequently than the mystical, sensual, even at times erotic, love poetry of people like Rumi and Hafez. Second only to the Quran. We have many, many more copies of these texts than we do of any legal text, philosophical text, theological text, or even for that matter, Quranic commentary. If you were going to stereotype, and we should never stereotype because it's just not nice and it's beneath us, but if you were going to stereotype Muslims in this medieval time period, you should stereotype them as a people of sensual, mystical, erotic love poetry. 
because that's what they chose to copy over and over and over again. I want to focus on one particular tradition that culminates in this um, supremely gifted poet and mystic Rumi, but not treat him the way that people usually treat him. Um, in North Carolina, where I live, we've got a couple of bookstores still left. Bookstores are kind of struggling right now. Independent bookstores are really struggling right now. And we have a very good one. And it's got a religion section, which was in reality the Christianity section. Most religion bookshelves are the Christianity bookshelf. And then there's Judaica and Eastern religions, right? So we spend some time saying, well, you know, if this is Christianity, don't call it religion, call it Christianity. And they did. And so for a while there was Christianity, Judaica, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, Taoism, and Rumi. Rumi was his own religion. He stood above, literally above all the other religions. I so wish that I had taken a picture of that because that would go on the cover of my next book. We treat Rumi as this genius that just appears out of nowhere. And in some ways, we almost are surprised when we find out that he was a pious, observant Muslim who called himself and was called by other people the offspring of the soul of the prophet. Farzand John and Mustafa, the offspring of the soul of the prophet. He has this very intimate connection with the being of the prophet Muhammad. Many of the common English translations of Rumi quite deliberately leave out any references to Islam, any references to the Quran, any references to the Prophet Muhammad. And the translators tell you, well, we think people are going to trip. They don't like Muslims these days anyway, so why show them that there's all these references to the Quran and to the Prophet? And they also recognize that many people today have a hard time for very good reasons with religious traditions, religious institutions, religious authority, right? the kind of abuse that you're seeing, which is rampant. It's in every tradition. It's in every community. Right? It is not restricted only to the Catholic Church. And if you think your tradition is not suffering from it, you probably just aren't looking hard enough. There's not a single one of our communities and our traditions that doesn't have this extraordinary level of abuse at some point. So many of the people who are translating Rumi, whenever Rumi says God, they say, beloved. Well, Rumi calls God beloved sometimes. But if you always translate it as beloved, how are you supposed to know that this is also a poetry of sacredness, of sanctity, of transcendence? How do you read it as not just a really great line of poetry that you can text to somebody that you're trying to get them to go out with you, and it's very effective for that, but it's also designed to pull your soul closer to God. So the way that I always try to encourage us to think of Rumi is he might be a majestic peak he might be a Mount Everest in the landscape of Islamic spirituality, but you don't get Everest standing by itself. Everest comes out of a mountain range, and these, there's all these other mountains, tall and majestic in their own right, that are propelling and pushing and holding up the tallest ones. That's just as true in other religious traditions as well. 
Um, one of the things that keeps me coming back to the city of Memphis, and I'm going to be back with, uh, with you all in, in this city in a couple of weeks, is, of course, uh, the legacy of Dr. King here. And every time that people talk about, you know, when are we going to have the next Martin Luther King, that's actually the wrong question. Martin doesn't come out of the thin air any more than Rumi came out of the thin air. There's always a movement, a people, a teaching, a tradition that produces them. So if you want a Rumi, if you want a Martin, if you want a Malcolm, you got to invest in us becoming the kind of people who would produce luminous beings like this. So what is this tradition that produces Rumi? It talks about itself as an unapologetically Muslim way of relating to God and humanity. The kind of stories that they tell you and they teach us go something like this. This particular story is a thousand years old. Um, it tells the story of an African Muslim mystic named Zulnun, or Zulnun in Eastern languages. Um, in this day and age, people had dreams of God and the sacred all the time. And God talked with them. I think nowadays, if God talks to you in your dreams, people give you some good pills to sedate you and medicate you. But in this time, this was much more common. So it says that Zulnun has uh, a vision of God in the Day of Judgment. And it says that he sees all the human beings who have ever been, all the human beings who are, and all the human beings who shall forever be collected in front of Allah. They then hear the voice of God coming to them gently and softly, offering a series of gifts. The first time the voice of God asks them, who among you would like to receive the sum total of all the worldly pleasures? Every delight, every joy, every tantalizing pleasure that I have ever created in this world. Who would like that? People are wondering where the catch is. Right? There's always a, if you do this and this and this, and keep my covenants, then I will bless you, right? There's no covenant here. It's just, who would like? So Zulnun says, I saw about 90% of people put up their hand. We sure would like the sum total of all the pleasures. And the voice of God comes to them and says, it is granted unto you. And people are like, no catch, no catch. So they're just happy and they leave. Voice of God comes to them a second time. Who here would like to be freed from all suffering? No pain, no torment, no hellfire. People are like, no catch, no catch. No pain, no suffering, no agony, no sickness, no death, no hellfire. Second time, it is granted unto you. So they do the happy dance and they leave. Now there's a pretty small crowd left. Third time, who among you wishes for my loftiest and most luminous paradise, a garden that no eye has ever seen and no words have even began to describe? Wow, luminous garden, loftiest paradise, no eye has ever seen, no sign me up. So 90% of those who are left put up their hands. Third time, it is granted unto you, and they leave. 
Lin Zul Noon says, there was like four or five people left. And this time they hear the voice of God thundering at them. I offered you every earthly delight. You chose it not. I offered you freedom from pain and hellfire. You chose it not. I even gave you unconditionally my most luminous garden. You chose it not. What are you here for? And Zolnun says, these four or five people who are left, they can't even utter an answer. They lower their heads in humility, and they said, you know why we are here. We didn't come for a garden. We didn't come to avoid hellfire. And we didn't come for pleasure. We came for you. One last time they hear the voice of God saying, in that case, I am yours. I am yours. That has always been a tradition within this larger world of Islamic spirituality, where it doesn't articulate itself as, here's what you got to do to be saved, here's what you got to do to get into heaven, here's what you got to do to avoid hellfire. What you are seeking is the Divine Beloved. You're searching after God's own heart. And that's a thousand-year tradition that leads us to people like Rumi. When you go to Rumi's shrine, there are inscriptions there that remind you. And they say things like, Baza, Baza, Harancha Hasti Baza. Come, come again. Whatever you are, come back again. Even if you see yourself as an infidel, as a fire worshiper, even if you have bowed down in front of idols, come back. This sacred gathering of ours is no place to be hopeless. Even if you've repented a hundred times and a hundred times you've broken your vows, come, come again. The very beginning words of invitation in the tradition remind you that you come to this path, you come on this path, precisely because you have failed. Precisely because you've tried and fallen flat on your face. So this is, in some ways, a path for the failures. The path of for people who've tried to do things right and they feel like, I just can't do it on my own. And the divine call is, you're not alone. You don't have to do this on your own. You see translations of that particular poem that have been recited and chanter, chanted. Some of the translations is a little iffy, but come, come, whoever you are wanderer, worshiper, not sure what that lover of leaving thing is. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Even if you've broken your vow a hundred times, come, come again. And so the main invitation, the main starting point is that returning to the arms of the Divine Beloved. And that's where we start. Um, here is Rumi's tomb in Konya. Konya is a city in modern Turkey. The word Konya comes from the Greek Iconium. This was the city of icons. It was sacred in a Christian time, and it's sacred in its Muslim time. In this part of the world, holy is as holy does. Sacred sites do not stop becoming sacred. If it was sacred in ancient times, it continues to be sacred 
in Jewish times and Christian times and Muslim times, and oftentimes people are sharing in these sacred sites. Nobody has a monopoly on these sacred sites. When it was towards the end of Rumi's life, he said in this beautiful little poem, I came into this world in the arms of my mama. And when my time to leave has come, trust me to the arms of my mother, meaning the earth. I want to be embraced by my mother, and the only thing I want over me is that blue dome, meaning the heavens, the sky. Seems to be the only thing his disciples ever disobeyed him on. They're like, well, you're going to get a blue dome. It may not be the blue dome that you were thinking of, but it's a blue dome. And what is inscribed around this um, tealish colored dome is the Ayatul Kursi, the verse of the throne in the Quran, that to be in the presence of such a soul is to remind you of what it's like to have a taste of encountering God. There's a wonderful story from Rumi's life that illustrates uh, this particular story. When he was living and teaching in Konya, this was a city of Muslims and Jews and Christians and Armenians and Greeks and Kurds and Persians and Arabs, oh my. But the courtly language, the literary language, the, if you would, the refinement language was Persian. Persian was the lingua franca of this part of the world. And so all of these other folks, the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims, if they wanted to sit with Rumi, if they wanted to hang with Rumi, they all had to learn Persian. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of learning a second language, not as a child, but a little bit later in your life. It's not easy, right? I had to learn English at the age of 15, and even now, all these years later, there's still a couple of things that trip me up. And my daughter still corrects. It's like, Baba, it's not Tuesday or Tuesday. It's whichever the other one is that I say. I never know if it's a coupon or a coupon, but whatever I say is the wrong one, right? And so there was all these people that had to learn Persian, but they kept messing it up. And there's this one Greek Christian guy that I'm very fond of. He's almost like a comic relief character. Every time he shows up in the Rumi stories, and we've got about 800 pages of Rumi stories from the 1200s. Right? We probably know more Rumi stories than about any other Muslim figure in the medieval world. His name is Suryanus, and he becomes Muslim to hang out with Rumi, and he's given the name Alaeddin Aladdin to white people. <laughs> and Greek is his language, but he tries to learn Persian. But he's having a hard time speaking this eloquent Persian of Rumi. So Rumi's followers used to call him Lord in the way that in Victorian era, we talked about someone being Lord, Shelley and Byron and kind of whoever. But there's that kind of a Lord and there's capital L, Lord, God. And you don't want to confuse these two. And this poor little Syrianus guy keeps messing up. He wants to call Rumi small L Lord, and he keeps calling him big L Lord. And not everybody in Konya was a mystic. Not everybody was an illuminated soul. And there are some dry legalistic, you might even call them fundamentalist types. And they hear him call Rumi capital L Lord, and they grab him by the collar and take him in front of a judge. And they're like, this infidel has called Rumi Lord. Kill him. And the judge is like, seems to have been a reasonable person. 
Now, now, children, let's understand what this young man has meant. So he turns to him and says, my friend, Rumi is an old man by now. Surely you don't mean to call him capital L Lord. What did you mean to say? And Serianus is like, ah, oh, I always do this. I always mess up. I always use the wrong word. And the judge is like, see, I told you, it was just a misunderstanding. What did you mean to call him, my son? And Serianus says, I didn't mean to call him God. I meant to call him Godmaker. And all the dry legalistic fundamentalist people are like, we're going to kill him, we're going to crucify him, we're going to burn him, and then we're going to spread his ashes. And the judge is like, son, if you know that he's not God, how can he be God maker? And so Giannis is like, ah, oh, I always do this. This Persian thing is so hard. I always use the wrong word. What I meant to say was, he makes God real to me. He makes God real for me. He said, before I met him, God was an idea, an abstraction, an idea in my head, a word on a page. He says, when I met him, I knew that God had to be real. He made God real. That's, in some ways, the significance of these folks, that when you're with them, when you're around them, you know that God has to be real. In the medieval times, there were shrines, music assemblies, and actually academies, which were spread in Europe, in North Africa, and in so many parts of the Middle East, devoted specifically to the teaching, the recitation of Rumi's poetry. And the heart of the practice was and is in the city of Konya. This is where people come for pilgrimage. Pilgrimage was such an important medieval practice. We were talking today. Um, I went to Graceland today. That's a pilgrimage, folk. That's a, that might be a secular pilgrimage for me, but it's a pilgrimage. And going to Lorraine Motel, that's a holy pilgrimage for me. But they're both pilgrimages. And there are millions of people who come here and continue to come here. In the last 25 years or so, the poetry of Rumi has become among the best-selling poetry in the English language. Most of us, unless you're a literature professor, would be hard-pressed to name two poet laureates of our country. And our poet laureates usually sell five, six, ten thousand copies of their books. The Coleman Barks translations of Rumi have sold well over a million copies. Right? Somehow, Rumi has become an antidote for people's spiritual seeking. But there is a complication. There's a messiness. Um, these translations aren't done from the original. They're always second and third hand translations from the original. And as we talked about, they minimize the Islamic context. Rumi himself describes his work as the unveiler of the Quran. I've made up a new word. I say Rumi's poetry is the most Quranful of all Islamic literatures. There's 3,000 references to the Quran in his poetry. And some of these translations deliberately leave those out. So I want us to remember that there's a legacy of people 
who are coming and continue to come to these places because when they're encountering these beings, these teachings, these stories, these poems, that's where they feel closest to God. That's where they're reminded that God is real, beauty is real, love is real. Some of you, some of us might have heard of the phrase, the expression, whirling dervish. And it's kind of ironic that in the way that we use it, oh, he's like a whirling dervish going around. Like we almost use it to mean frantic activity. If you actually watch the practices of the whirling dervishes, it's the exact opposite. It is a slow, purposeful, intentional practice where you are focused on your breath, where you realize that the breath is the connection between your body and your soul. The goal of becoming a mystic on the path of love is not to learn to whirl. The whirling is a tool, it's a technique, so that you don't move through your life unaware. Not all Sufis, not all Muslims whirl, a very small percentage do, but this is one technique. And like everything else that comes out of this tradition, there's a profound meaning that's attached to it. When you observe the whirlers, you notice that they always have one foot the left foot that is stationary on the ground, and it's the right foot that is circling around them. It's to remind you that our lives are supposed to be a balance between activity and repose. We have gone so far over to the idea of activity. We actually measure our worth through how busy we are. And so often when we see each other and we ask each other, how are you doing? You know, people don't actually tell you anything about how their heart is. It's just, oh, you know, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. Oh, honey, we're all busy. You didn't tell me anything. In old Muslim languages, when you would want to ask someone, how are you, what you would actually ask them is, how is the state of your heart? How is your hal? How is your heart? We've got to learn to balance motion and stillness. And if you look at their hands, one hand, the right hand, is always turned heavenward, and one hand is always turned towards the earth. The imagery is one of dancing in rain. Imagine living in an arid climate where water is the water of life. And water is the difference between life and lack thereof. So what the dervishes are doing is that they are dancing in rain, collecting divine life, divine grace with one hand, and it is flowing through them. Their bodies, their being is becoming a channel of grace, and they're releasing that onto creation. But for the rain and for the grace to flow through you, you've got to empty yourself. You've got to hollow yourself. You've got to abandon that sense of ego. This is something that Rumi talks about. As long as you're clutching on to ego with both hands, there's no room for the Divine Beloved to enter your heart. before you can even get to the point of affirming God, 
you have to negate your own selfishness. Right? That's one of the differences between what I would say is a genuine path of spiritual transformation and one that just says, you as you are, are just divine. Rumi has this beautiful anecdote. There's always a yes and. He says, every single one of us is a jackass. with wings of angels tacked on. We all have our inner jackass that we have to come to terms with, but you also have been given celestial wings to soar. Come to terms with your assness. Stop being an ass to yourself, to others, and then you can soar. But that does call for a cooking, a maturing, a transformation. These are not just teachings in museums. This is a living tradition that continues today. Male teachers and female teachers. Um, here's a teacher that when we go to Turkey, we always um, visit. Um, a woman probably close to 60 years old. Um, I've been studying Rumi's poetry for about 30, 35 years or so. I think I learned a couple of things about him. Probably not a day goes by that I don't spend a few hours on his poetry. I sit with her, and all I want to say is, you know nothing, Jack Snow. You know nothing, John Snow. You know nothing, Omid Snow. You know nothing, Fatima Snow. I don't you realize that there's people whose level of knowledge just far, far exceeds you. In the medieval times, when people wrote this kind of poetry, it didn't look like this, as beautiful as this book is. It looked like that. It was an illuminated manuscript done the same way that the Quran and the Bible would have been done in the medieval times, where you've got calligraphy and illumination joined together. The very first page of Rumi's Masnavi is actually in Arabic. هذا كتاب المثنوي وهو أصول 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 الدين في كشف أسرار الوصول واليقين It rhymes. وهو فقه الله الأكبر والشرع الله الأزهر This is the book of the rhyming couplets and it is, as we would say down south, the root of the root of the root of religion. the roots of the roots of the roots of religion in the erotic unveiling, right? This is a bridal imagery. Before you can make love to your beloved, there's an unveiling that takes place. In the unveiling of the heart secrets of God in union and certainty. You got to learn to make love to God. But if you want to do that, you got to figure out what is the root of the root of the root of your faith. Muslim scholars of this time period always talked about religion in a tree metaphor. It's got a trunk. It's got lots of branches. The part of the tree that appears to you is mostly the branches. What is grounding the tree? So Rumi starts out by this metaphor that talked to you about the grounding of your faith. 
he starts by telling you, think about whatever it is that's grounding you. Is it your name, your reputation, your GPA, what school you went to, how much your corrupt parents bribed the school for you to get into it? That, that makes me mad, I tell you. It's like a person of color who worked his ass off to get into college. I'm like, and you mean not everybody here got in the same way? Like that, that makes me mad. Okay. It's a Jedi mind trick. Okay, all right. Is it the neighborhood you live in? Is it the size of your bank account? Is it your physical beauty? Is it how lovely your partner is? Was it how many Facebook followers you have? What grounds that? What happens after you're no longer so attractive? If it's about your wealth, what happens if your wealth falls? If it's about your health, what happens when you get sick? Whatever you think of as the anchor of your life, what is anchoring that? And what is anchoring that? And he's using these metaphor of roots to tell you what do the roots of a tree do for it? They give you nutrients. And what happens if you don't get nutrients? What kind of a tree do you become? A dead tree, a brittle tree tree that's no longer given fruit. One of the first things that he starts out by telling you is there's lots of people who might be religious. They might believe all the right things. They might say the right prayers. They might do the right practices. But their religiosity is a dry kind of religiosity. So don't be a dry person. Have your heart be moist. Have your heart be tender with beauty, with kindness, with love, with mercy. And the other thing that the roots of a tree do is they ground you. They anchor you. And Rumi's telling you, in life there's going to be storms. There are going to be storms of life that are going to come to try to knock you down. Are you anchored? Are you rooted? What happens when that calamity comes that you didn't see it come? Do you have the teachings to help you ride through the storm? If you pay attention to these miniatures, these manuscripts, beautiful calligraphy, illuminated, all around the edges, and almost all of them contain an arrow on the right, the left, sometimes above and below. And that's a reminder for you to look beyond the page. Because God is not only on the page, God is also outside. Many of these mystics tell you, could you read clouds and rivers and streams and mountains and woods verse by verse, chapter by chapter, as you've learned to read the Quran and the Gospels and the Torah? They actually call the book of nature God's cosmic Quran, the existential Quran. They say that's the big Quran, and this Quran in the book is the little Quran. Could we learn to look for the divine in nature, and could we learn to look for the divine inside our own hearts? This is the oldest copy of the Masnavi that we have, Rumi's masterpiece. And I love the fact that just like a teacher marking up your papers, 
the original copy editor, the guy who was copying it by hand, had said, this is the book of the Masnavi, and it is the root of the root of the faith. And Rumi's son, just like a teacher, goes through with a red pen. And he's like, uh-uh. It's not just the root of the root of religion. It's the root of the root of the root. Right? You've got to get deep in there. You've got to know yourself. You've got to be willing to go to those dark, shadowy places that you've been too afraid to look. The path takes work. In time, some of the followers of this tradition who knew of Rumi's love for the Prophet reciprocated that love, and they even imagined the Prophet sitting in paradise reading Rumi's poetry with people in great imagination of, of these folks. And of course, Rumi's followers are not just whirling, they're also praying. They're also reading prayer manuals. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa ilayka ya'ud salam Our loving Lord, you are peace. And peace emanates from you. And peace returns to you. So aliven us, our loving Lord, through peace. A genuine peace. A peace that is not simply the absence of fighting, but the presence of tranquility. Many of us are hoping for, aspiring to see a peaceful kind of a world. And Rumi talks about this work has to begin in our own hearts. He gives you a powerful metaphor of a guest house. This is one of the most beloved poems of Rumi called The Caravanserai or The Guest House. And this is the actual one that we visit when we go to Turkey. So what's a caravanserai? In a medieval time when people didn't have cars without a cooling engine and you would travel on a caravan, and traveling in the middle of the desert was dangerous because there could always be highway robbers who could attack you and steal your goods. You would want to travel until you got to this fortress-like caravanserai where people could shut the door and you'd be safe. And you could put down your load and you could do trade with whoever else is there and you could stay for up to three days without paying rent. So imagine if there's like free hotels on the highway. That was the system in Rumi's time period. There were these guest houses spread through the road. Rumi says, think of your own heart as being a guest house. Treat your own thoughts and your own emotions not as you, but as your guests. Think about when you ask each other, how are you doing? If they don't just tell you, I'm busy, they might say, I am happy. I am miserable. I am massively stressed because I got four midterms. I am happy. I am sad. I am stressed. You are the heart. Happiness, sadness, stress, these are your guests. So this is how Rumi actually tells you to begin the path of establishing peace, not just out in the world, but with yourself. And he says, look, here comes joy. Hello, joy. You are one of my favorite guests. Come on in. You know where you like to go and be comfortable. I know you will stay one day, two days, three days, and then you will leave. Be at home for as long as you're here. Oh, look. 
here comes sadness. Could you treat that guest with the same grace? Hello, sadness. You are actually one of my favorite guests. There have been times in my life where all the other guests stopped visiting me, but you came so faithfully again and again and again. Come on in. You know where you like to go to. Make yourself at home. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to resist you. I'm not going to evict you. Stay for a day or two or three, and I know that you too will leave. Could you actually begin by being magnanimous with your own emotions, with your own thoughts? It's so hard for us to be gracious and graceful with other people if we've never learned to be gracious with our own selves. As we do this, you begin to find that your life becomes a melody, that there's beauty that your life produces. that your very existence can become, can serve as an invocation of what is lovely. He tells a wonderful story. We're wrapping up. I've taken 55 minutes. He tells a wonderful story, borrowing it from a Greek source of an old man who is wandering through the town in broad daylight with a lit torch. And strange image, someone going around with a torch in the daylight. And they're like, what are you looking for? And he says, as divo dad malulam in sonam orizust. I'm sick and tired of these two-legged beasts and demons. I'm looking for one real human being. And people say, ah, a real human, none of those to be found. And his answer is, that one that you tell me is not to be found, that's the one that I want to find. I'm going to either find me one or I'm going to become one. To become a real human being, to become what you already are, but to become so fully is part of the goal of this path. He's got a wonderful line in which he talks about love is the astrolabe of the secrets of God. And this word astrolabe is a weird one for us. In the medieval times, people used it to find the stars and to know which way is what. And what he tells you in this poem is that, honey, we're all lost. We all feel like we've lost our way, but there is a way home, and that way is love. If you learn to walk in the path of love, you can find your way back home to God. How do you do so? takes work. He tells you a wonderful story of Layla and Majnun. Layla, if you grew up of a certain age, Eric Clapton, Derek and Dominoes, Layla, coolest guitar riff in history. That Layla was taken from this great Muslim story. This is the Romeo and Juliet of the East 500 years earlier, and a lot more dramatic. We're told that there was once a lover who was so in love with Layla that he even lost his own name. He was just called the love-crazed one, the one who's given himself over in love. And he wrote the most beautiful poems for Layla. 
the words of these poems spreads far and wide until the ruler of the town came to hear them and he was like, I gotta meet me, this Layla. Whoever this woman is that would inspire such a kind of poetry, that's somebody I've got to meet. And because it's good to be the king, he summons all the women from Layla's village to be brought to his court, and he's just tingling with his excitement. And he's like, I'm going to go, I'm going to meet this most beautiful girl. And he walks in, and he's fully expecting one of these women to just stand out. And he looks, and he looks, and he looks, and he looks, it's okay. But there's no one woman that just stands out. Every one of them is what my daughter in middle school calls normies. And so he turns to his advisor and he's like, did you bring Layla? They're like, oh yeah, she's here. So the king is really confused. He thinks about the poems that praise Layla's beauty. And he turns to the women and he's like, is one of y'all Layla? The king was a southern king. And Layla steps forward. And the king looks at her. She just looks like all the other ones. And he goes, you? You are Layla? And Layla says, sometimes the women in these poems talk back. I am Layla, but you are not Majnun. And then what Rumi says is, in order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to learn to look through the eyes of Majnun. Can we learn to train our eyes so that we only look for beauty in one another? Can we learn to train our ears so that we only listen to beautiful conversations? Can we train this most difficult muscle so that this only speaks in kindness? I teach on a college campus where 48 percent of my female students report being sexually assaulted. Report. Could we think of transforming our touch so that it is never a touch that grabs and possesses and clings, but it is only in all ways an invited touch, a welcomed comfort? What he tells you is that if you want to go on the path of love, you've got to learn to transform your body. You've got to transform your faculties. You've got to transform your touch, your taste, your eyes, your ears, your heart. That transformation takes work. And that work is one that would take a lot more than the hour that we have. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Remember that for these mystics, love is not an emotion. Love is not a feeling. Love is not, as I say sometimes to my kids, love is not an emoji. You can't text love. Love for them is the very being of Allah. It's the very essence of the divine. Which erupts out of God, brings this world into creation, sustains you, and then will lead you back home. Think of love, as Rumi talks about it, as a cosmic current which flows from God into this world back to God. 
And if you want to learn to love God, you have to learn to love these difficult beings called human beings. Their starting point is basically what Bob Marley would have told you. There's one love. The love of humanity and the love of God mingle, are connected. So I think we'll uh, kind of stop here. If you had more time, uh, I could probably go on a little bit more. Um, I'm thankful for the gift of time that you all have brought to us. Some of you um, have obligations to be elsewhere. Some of you have been bribed to be here for an hour, and you're under no obligation to be here any more than an hour. Um, I'm happy to take questions. And if you do need to leave, um, please feel free to, to do so. Are there any questions that people have? Yes, sir. Yes, wonderful question. So, um, the Sufi path is not a sectarian uh, affiliation. There are Sunnis who are mystically inclined, and there are Shia who are mystically inclined. I think the analogy I sometimes I give people is it's kind of like asking people um, which denomination do you find lovers in. Well, that, that kind of, it's, it's a separate question, right, in that, in that sense. I think one of the big differences between the way that whatever term you want to use for it, and all of these are problematic, and all of them are Christian-centric, uh, and all of them are in some ways flawed, spirituality, esotericism, mysticism. The difference is that in a Christian tradition, the monastic setting was a pivotal one, for the development of Christian mysticism. It wasn't exclusive, but it was a very prominent role. In the Sufi tradition, in the Islamic tradition as a whole, you, don't, you have nothing like a permanent monasticism. You've got Sufi gatherings in which you go to sit with a teacher and they tell you stories, and you might do some chanting and meditation together, and then you come home to your husband, to your children, to your partner, to your family, to your friends. The model of mysticism in Islam was never based on the notions of celibacy or permanent places of living apart from society. It was more, oh, it's Thursday night. We're going to go to the Sufi lodge. We're going to listen to the teacher for a couple of hours. We might play some music, sing some poems, and then we're going to come home. So in that way, it was, a, it was a much more integrated with other aspects of society. Um, it was also, statistically speaking, a much more popular one. Um, Again, it's hard to have numbers on things because what percentage of a society are lovers? In those societies in which people had to fill out cards, do you belong to a Sufi community or not? 90% of the Muslims in a place like Senegal, West Africa, identify themselves as belonging to a Sufi community. 80% of Egyptian men in the 19th century identified themselves as belonging to a Sufi community. Like this was much more of a mainstream tradition in Muslim societies than phenomena such as Christian monasticism or certainly Kabbalah were in comparable Jewish and Christian societies.
other questions. Yes. So well, my question is, um, what do you think of the state of Sufism like today? And the reason why I'm asking that is because, as you said, Sufi, uh, Sufi uh, poetry, and particularly Rumi's poetry, is very popular in the English language in a lot of English-speaking countries like the U.S. However, you know, I've seen that many Muslim communities are kind of, at least now, they, they like they like Rumi's poetry and traditions are very like, unrecognizable. Right. And you know, I, I hear a lot of people who are, you know, don't follow super traditions, knowing about Rumi and his poetry, regardless of like whether they leave the Islamic character out of it. Yep. Then you see in Muslim communities themselves, and and like for example, like you said, you know, back a couple centuries ago, a lot of people would like. Uh, I guess, recognize themselves as being part of a Sufi community. That's, That's right. right. For example, like the place where my family came from, Somalia, 90% of Somalis consider themselves part of some Sufi order. That's right. Today, it's like almost non-existent. Yeah. So I was just asking, what do you think of the state of Sufism today and how it will go forward? Yeah, I mean, as is the case with many other things, um, it's, in, it's in crisis. It's in danger for a few different reasons. Um, and it's good to share the blame generously around. Um, so I start by blaming things on what I always like to blame, white people. More specifically, colonial powers. When the colonial powers get to Muslim societies, they get to see the Sufi communities as extraordinarily powerful, as a place that people have their allegiance to, much more so than they have to kings. They expect kings to be drunk fornicators. I was going to make a Trump joke, but I won't. They don't trust the kings to represent the highest ideals of their spiritual faith. They look to their spiritual teachers. And many of these spiritual teachers were actively working against colonial occupation. Just because they're on the side of love, it doesn't mean that they're also not socially and politically involved. Think about someone like Dr. King as a great example of that. So what the European colonial powers did, and they were conflicted because they're reading this stuff They like it too much. What they said was, we came into these lands deciding already that black and brown people are inferior to us and that Islam is inferior to our Christian faith. How can inferior people produce such beautiful teachings and stories and practices? Ta-da! These stories must not be Islamic. So there's a 200-year Orientalist colonial tradition starting in Europe and later on in America that says, this is beautiful because it's Greek. This is beautiful because it's Christian. This is beautiful because it's Hindu. This is beautiful even because it's Persian. It is not beautiful because, as they keep telling you, they are the children of the soul of the prophet. They're beautiful in spite of Islam, not because of Islam. That's the Orientalist colonial answer. That answer is related to factor number two, which is, for about the last 100 to 150 years, the colonial powers begin setting up institutions of higher learning in Muslim societies. Not only that, many Muslim societies send initially their brightest sons, and only sons, and with time, their sons and daughters, to those elite Western institutions to study. And people are going there when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. And the first intellectual encounter with Islam that they're having is at Oxford. It's in Cambridge. It's in Princeton. It's at Yale. It's at Duke. It's wherever. 
And what are their teachers teaching them? That this stuff is beautiful, but it's not Muslim. And these young Muslim intellectuals become the Muslim modernists, the rationalists who are trying to reform Islam. But all of them, in some ways, buy into an enlightenment project, which says the highest human faculty is reason and rationality. And love and mysticism, these are lower. They're not as refined as our intellect. So the Muslim modernists, on one hand, also join their Orientalist teachers in critiquing and criticizing Sufism. And then the real full-on assault against Sufism comes from Wahhabis. Um, this is not a lecture on Wahhabism. Let it just be said that something is a little bit peculiar when the president of these United States of America says that the Saudis are our allies in fighting radical Islam when the Saudis are the source, the ideological sponsor of radical Islam worldwide. How can your allies be both the source and the cure? I'm not a very smart man, but I haven't figured that one out yet. And it's the Wahhabis who, for the first time in the history of Islam, very explicitly say, the Shia, not Muslim. The Sufis, not Muslim. People who do chanting, not Muslim. People who might use prayer beads, not Muslim. People who celebrate the Prophet's birthday, not Muslim. Before this, there was an etiquette to disagreement among Muslim scholars. And it always went something like this. I think I'm right with the possibility of being wrong. I think you're wrong with the possibility of being right. And God knows best. And what they critiqued was never, are you a Muslim? It was this practice, that teaching, is something that I have questions about. But with Wahhabis, it is entire wholesale dimensions of Islam being defined as un-Islamic to the point that shedding the blood of these folks has been considered historically permissible. So here's the weird context that we find ourselves in. We got Wahhabis and Muslim modernists who don't agree on anything except for the fact that Sufis aren't Muslim being joined by European Orientalists. And meanwhile, you've got California New Agers who are like, well, if you all don't want Rumi, we're happy to take him. So Islam and Sufism, which historically kind of used to be like this, are now almost like being pulled apart. Some people want to say that Sufism is un-Islamic, and some people want to say Islam has nothing to do with these realms of poetry and beauty and meaning and mysticism. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. I think I saw two hands go up. Can I add just real quickly? Yes, sir. Elaborate Orientalist, what you mean exactly by that? Yeah. So, I mean, Edward Said, may, uh, may he rest Sorry, in peace. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just sure. Um, he wrote a whole book in 1978 called Orientalism, um, which has redefined so many fields from religious studies to art history to sociology and anthropology to others. It's essentially, he talks about, it's the system of studying and dominating not actual people, but a whole part of humanity that is imagined to be the Orient. So if you think that I teach in a ridiculous department called the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, because in the eyes of the university, China, Japan, and Korea, 
quintessentially belong in the same discussion as Morocco and Algeria, because they were all the Orient, the non-West. And Saeed talks about how this project of imagining the Orient was always in the context of also ruling over and colonizing the Orient. It doesn't mean that if you are, you know, a nice friend from Memphis and you happen to love Rumi poetry that you're somehow a bad person or that you're an Orientalist. It just means that there's politics involved in the ways that these disciplines have historically evolved, and we should be mindful and aware and critical about these, the history of our fields. I think you have a question? Hi. Hello. Can you talk a little bit about the differences or similarities in the various Sufi orders? Um, you know, I don't know if you mentioned Senegal. I spent a lot of time in Senegal. Yes. Yeah. Because of, you know, clothing and everything. Absolutely. But then, like in a place like Egypt, it's almost like an underground movement. So can you say a little bit? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I mean, historically, these different Sufi teachings tended to coalesce around particular Sufi orders. And they almost each have their own flavor in the same way that if you sat with a lot of Jesuits and Franciscans and Benedictines, you begin to sort of catch the flavor of each community. And you can go to Rumi's Sufi order, and you're going to hear a lot of music, you're going to hear a lot of poetry, you're going to hear a lot of teachings of the one love that flows through people. If we went over to Pakistan, where the most prominent Sufi community is the Chishti order, right? There's a particular lineage that I know a little bit called the Chishti Sabaris, where you get together every Thursday night and you sit in pure meditative silence. And you focus on the breath and there's an attunement to the presence of the teacher. And at some point after an hour, he might look up and go, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. And everybody packs up and leaves. And if you had come from another planet and you're in Rumi circle, where there's music and poetry and singing and banging on drums, and then you go into this quiet meditative one, you're like, how can these two be part of the same tradition? But they are. Yet they have their own flavor. Some of them are very highly metaphysical deep practices of meditation. Some of them are quite ecstatic, focused around music and poetry. The one commonality is that almost all of them come back to this necessity of having a teacher. You know, um, most of us would probably not trust ourselves to go to someone who says, you know, I watched a couple of YouTube videos on how to do heart surgery. I hear you need a heart surgery. I watched five videos on it. Let me cut open your heart. And you'd be like, no, thank you. I think I would rather have a system of certification. And it's the same way in a Sufi tradition. They would say, you're here dealing with very sensitive material. The heart, the soul, people's yearning for God, our egos, the way that we bump up against each other. And just as you would hope that a surgeon has shadowed somebody, they've done an internship with somebody, they walked in somebody's footsteps, they watch how that person holds the scalpel and how they make the incision. And the first time that they did it, the senior surgeon held their hand and then they watched them. That when it comes to the spiritual path, you would want to have a kind of quality control and not just have someone who's listened to a couple of nice Sufi stories on YouTube start giving you spiritual advice. So I think there's all the, one of the commonalities is this deep attachment to the prophet, a, an intense experience of the divine, and then the need to have a teacher, a mentor, a guide, 
who accompanies you for some portion of the path, whether it's seen as a temporary accompaniment or as a permanent one. Uh, I think those are some of the flavors in common. Owen, thank you so thank much for you. visiting our campus again, and we are so glad that unlike the first time, you didn't stay in the car. Uh, <laughs> Please join us. Thank you.